Okay, we're ready to get started with the lunchtime speaker. Uh, Alice Bowman, she's the Mission Operations Manager for the New Horizons program. Uh, other people just call it the cool mission to Pluto, if you don't know what New Horizons is. Uh, she does work at Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab, and that's where they operate the, the mission from. Uh, it is still going. It is still getting farther and farther away, and we'll hear about that. Uh, I went online to learn about her, and I know she's been involved in space and the technologies in one sense since 1993, but I dug a little further. It actually goes back to watching Star Trek and Lost in Space, <laughs> if you're really looking for the origins of where uh, some of this comes from. Uh, she wanted me to keep it real short, so I will, kind of jumping down. The other thing that impressed me is some of her comments online about really what what excites her most is calmly searching for those solutions to hard technical problems. You know, that takes a lot of experience and creativity. And the ability to be calm where others want to get all excited and, and wrapped up. And I think that, that calmness is important, uh, one, for any mission operations manager. But especially when, heck, we went to Pluto. <laughs> so, Alice, come, come tell us what's going on. Hi everyone, it's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Um, I try never to miss an opportunity to talk about New Horizons and from the engineering point of view. Um, as Dan said, the operations is run out of the Applied Physics Laboratory, which is in Laurel, Maryland. And over the years, we've had a number of spacecraft that we've developed and operated. I think the count is up to 68. Um, and I guess what I really want to tell you is that I want to tell you about our journey to Pluto. And I'm going to do it from an engineering and operations point of view. So you won't see a lot of science. Um, so what I'm going to show you is the night of July 14th, 2015. And we just, the spacecraft had just passed the most treacherous part of its journey. It had flown through the Pluto system. And we were waiting for signal back from the spacecraft to find out if it had survived and if it had recorded data. And this is a video clip of the Mission Operations Center You'll see um, the operations center overflowing at the seams with engineers and operations personnel. And you'll see in the back, uh, behind windows in the next room, is the management, NASA management, program management. And once we get that signal, you'll see a very happy gentleman burst through the doors with his arms in the air. And um, every time I look at this video, I get that, that same feeling inside of that excitement and that fear all at the same time. In lock on symbols. So that's the first step. We're getting data. Okay, copy that. We're in lock with telemetry with the spacecraft. A lot of green numbers in that one. Yeah. Green is good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta get that, man. PI, mom on Pluto One. We have a healthy spacecraft. We've recorded data of the Pluto system, and we're outbound for Pluto. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> So there you have it. Um, the gentleman that came through that door, 
uh, Alan Stern. He's the principal investigator of this mission. And he'd been working at least since 1989 to get a mission funded to Pluto. So that was um, the result of that. So why did we want to go to Pluto? Um, for one reason, and I think the most important reason is because no one had ever been there before. When I was growing up, we had a couple of different, two different zones of the solar system, the rocky terrestrial planets, the inner planets, and the gas giants. And in 1992, um, Jewett and Lou started discovering these objects out in what we now call the third zone. And Pluto happens to be the king of that third zone. Pluto's orbit is depicted in the yellow around here, around in this uh, diagram, and so you can see that it's inclined from the uh, ecliptic. And when it was discovered in 1930 by Claude Tambo, everybody thought that was an oddball planet. Um, but now we know that it's just part of, the, of a much larger part of our solar system, and it's, it's not an oddball at all. It's more the norm of our solar system. These are just a few of the objects in the Kuiper Belt that have been discovered. Of course, Pluto is the most interesting so far. Um, it has a number of moons around it. Um, some people call it a binary planet. Charon, its largest moon, is so large that the center of gravity or the Barry Center is outside the surface of Pluto. So when you see these pictures that I'll show a little bit later, there's a slight wobble, and that wobble is attributed to that Barry Center being um, outside of the surface of Pluto. So this is what we knew about Pluto. This is taken with the most powerful telescope that we have from the Hubble Space Telescope. And being an engineer, I look at that picture and I see, gosh, that's kind of blobby and I'm not sure I understand what I'm seeing. Is it even round? Uh, but you would be amazed how much information the scientists can get out of this. Um, they knew it was going to be interesting when we went to, flew by it um, because of these light and dark areas that are already being shown. But still, we really didn't know. This is the best picture. Many, many technical challenges that we had to solve before a mission to Pluto was even possible. Of course, power was, was a big one. We needed to use nuclear power just because the sun is so very far away. And um, the solar panels would have to be the size of football fields if we were going to have enough power. And ion propulsion wasn't that um, developed yet. And what we wanted to do is to have a very simple mission that um, we could, that, that was very robust, that we could rely upon. So we didn't have a lot of new technology that we put forth as uh, part of the concept of this mission. Distance, of course, we all know it's 32 AU from Earth, and we all know that it takes eight minutes for light to travel um, one astronomical unit, one AU, and at Pluto, it's on the order of four and a half hours just to get a signal to the spacecraft, and then again, that much time to get it back. To, to find out if what we asked that spacecraft to do um, was actually done. How many missions do you know takes almost a decade to get to your prime objective? <laughs> so we had to have a spacecraft that was very robust, a team that was um, very robust, but also lean because we have a very limited budget. Um, the whole mission, um, including the launch vehicle, was $720 million very small budget when, it come, when you compare that to other outer planets. And a one chance to get this right, a flyby mission. You know, no do-overs, we, we can't go back and do it again. So one of the very important things that we wanted to do was build a very um, robust team. And I had the pleasure of putting together this team. Um, and I wanted to have a lot of different um, expertise on the project because I feel that when you're encountered with a problem, it takes many people to come to the table and solve that problem. And it may not be, you know, the aerospace engineer or the electrical engineer. It could, and so I wanted a variety of expertise at that table to solve these problems. We needed to have a team that was very respectful because we were going to be working together for a very, very long time. And um, we needed to make sure that we planned for all the what ifs, um, that the spacecraft had a lot of redundant paths. So a lot of work went into building the team. And I know this is a ground uh, system architecture 
workshop. Um, and many of you are probably familiar with what Operations do does, but just to, to put it in black and white, um, our primary purpose is to make sure that, that spacecraft is healthy and it reaches its prime target. We're also responsible for listening to those scientists and those um, engineers, the subsystem engineers, making sure that they get what they need out of the spacecraft. It could be calibrating an instrument, checking out a subsystem, and of course when we get to Pluto or when we were at Jupiter, putting together those command sets that translate those dreams of the scientists into um, instructions for the spacecraft. We watch the telemetry coming back from the spacecraft, make sure everything is healthy, and um, if it's not, we are the people at the forefront to coordinate that effort to return that spacecraft to nominal. So these, these next couple of slides are specifically, specifically for you guys because I wanted to show um, how this ground system just performed wonderfully. Um, we had a number of uh, contingency operations that uh, centered around the ground system. We have our primary mission operations center, and if anything were to happen to that, we could fail over to the, what we call the, the backup mission operations center, which was, is on a separate power line, um, power feed across the street, different part of the campus. And then for this flyby sequence, the nine-day sequence, we actually stood up a remote mock that was located at JPL. And this was in an earthquake-proof room, had its own server, and this was specifically to get that flyby sequence up to the spacecraft if for some reason we could not get it up from either the prime mock or the backup mock. And our plan was, um, if we had some kind of catastrophic event on the East Coast, we had a van reserved, we had two drivers on standby, and the plan was if we couldn't get that sequence up, when we planned to put it up, we would put three or four people in that van and they would take off for California. We figured they would take about three days to get here, giving us just enough time to put up that sequence at about the five and a half day out mark and still be able to accomplish um, the, the critical science in the flyby sequence. So those, that's an example of the lengths we went to to make sure that everything was robust, that we had, uh, in this case, a, a prime plan, a backup plan, and you know, a backup to the backup plan. Um, we also had the Emergency Control Center, ECC, at Goldstone, um, so that if for some reason something happened here on the West Coast, we could stand up that Emergency con Control Center at Goldstone. Um, we had our servers were in um, different locations around the laboratory. We use a RAID, which is um, internally redundant. Um, again, dispersed locations. We have two hardware simulators. We were very lucky that this mission um, was able to uh, afford the cost of putting together two hardware simulators. And um, we have those on separate networks and separate buildings. And I'm going to tell you a little bit later about what happened on July 4th and how these simulators came into play. Um, but for now, Power facilities ups, generator. Um, and we, we actually had a truck with a generator on it on it that we rented just for the nine days of the flyby sequence to make sure we had power, um, nightly, monthly backups. And then when we started, or the scientists started discovering additional moons, when we launched the spacecraft in um, January of 2006, Pluto was a planet. <laughs> it had three moons, Charon, Nixon, Hydra. And then in August of 2006, Pluto was reclassified because the AI, I, IAC came up with a different definition of a planet. But because of these moons, which um, we started thinking of as maybe hazards or debris, because in 2011, the fourth one was discovered and then the fifth one in 2012. So we developed an alternate sequence that we could use to fly through this most treacherous part of the Pluto system where we thought there would be 
a lot, or we had the highest probability of encountering debris. And if you've seen the picture, well, you'll see it in a minute. You'll see a picture of the spacecraft. It has a, a big antenna dish on it. And what that alternate sequence does for four hours in this um, flyby of the Pluto system, we would take that antenna dish and we'd put it to RAM and we'd go through the system like this to protect everything behind the spacecraft. Now, granted, we lose four hours of um, science, but we would still be able to accomplish the flyby and collect really good science. So that's what is meant by the alternate set. And this is the spacecraft. It's about the size of a baby grand piano. Um, very efficient in its power usage. Uh, we have seven scientific instruments on board the spacecraft, and if you were to power them all at the same time, they would take on the order of 30 watts, which is very low. Now, of course, we don't power them all on at the same time because they actually share an interface to the recorder. Um, and everybody probably knows in this room, we use the Deep Space Network for communications. Um, we use all three sites, Madrid, Spain, Canberra, Australia, and Goldstone, California. Primarily, we use the 70-meter antenna. And just to give you an idea of what ha how we have to think as operations people, with a round-trip light time, um, in this example of, of four hours and 25 minutes, which was about what it was on the day of the flyby in July 2015, um, we have developed uh, command sets that will ex execute out of memory. And so they're time tag, and as the the clock on the spacecraft ticks down, those commands will execute out of spacecraft memory. So if we want to get data from our spacecraft or telemetry, that spacecraft has to start sending that data at time zero, but on the ground, the antenna could be supporting another mission. As that bundle of telemetry makes its way down, it's still only halfway there, but look at how far that spacecraft has moved in that time. Um, that has taken place two hours and, and 12 minutes. And then finally, at four hours and 25 minutes, the ground receives the telemetry, yet the spacecraft has moved about 144,000 miles from where it started. Likewise, if you're gonna send a command to the spacecraft, you're gonna have to point to where the spacecraft's gonna be in the future. That's because that's where the spacecraft's gonna intercept those commands. So again, the same exercise, yet we see the commands going up from Earth. Nine, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. We have a mission we go. and lift off. I can off. see it. Oh, 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 like to listen to those people clapping at the launch site. Um, if you're in operations, you're not really clapping wholeheartedly until you get that first burst of telemetry from the spacecraft that happens after it separates um, from the motor, the spin-up, the SRM. And um, for us, for this spacecraft, it took 50 minutes from launch until we got that first burst of telemetry. And when we got that, the operations center exploded in, in um, applause, and we knew then that we had a mission to Pluto. We launched on an Atlas V, traveling 36,000 miles per hour past the, Earth, um, the moon in about nine hours, got to Jupiter in 13 months, and then still Pluto nine and a half years later. 
So, fastest man-made object launched from Earth in 2006, and I think it still holds the record of being the fastest man-made object launched from Earth. And the reason why we wanted to go on the fastest, baddest rocket we could afford was because Pluto has a 248-year orbit around the Sun, and in 1989 it was at its closest point to the Sun and to Earth. And since that time, it's been moving farther and farther away. And as it moves farther and farther away, that atmosphere, we believe, is going to starts to freeze to the surface of Pluto. And we want to get to Pluto when we have as much of that atmosphere to study as we possibly can. So that's why we wanted to get there very fast. So again, the milestones for this, this mission. Um, we did ha use Jupiter as a gravity assist. And what we did is we increased that velocity by about 9,000 miles per hour. So for those of you metric, 22 kilometers per second was our, um, we increased our flyby speed too. And um, what Jupiter allowed us to do was to calibrate our instruments. Even though those, those instruments were um, designed for the lighting conditions on Pluto, we were still able to learn a lot about those instruments, putting together those sequences. And if you're in operations, you know that there's a lot of planning that goes into those sets of commands, a lot of testing, validation, um, you know, just many, many things. And we start that process a couple of months ahead. And so we pretty much have a set of instructions for the um, spacecraft, you know, six, four weeks ahead of time. And so it was really interesting about this one. We got a message from Hubble Space Telescope, and they said, hey, we see something pretty cool happening on Io, which is a moon of Jupiter. We're not quite sure what it is, but um, have you guys planned to image Io? And actually, we had planned to image Io, and so we just happened to be at the right spot at the right time, and we were able to capture this volcano exploding, this is erupting, excuse me. Um, this is Tavarshtar volcano. And what's the, as that hot material comes up from the, the interior of the moon, it instantly freezes. And so that's why you're seeing all this um, looks like rocks, if you were to look closely, falling down. And, and just the height of that <laughs> plume on that volcano is pretty amazing to me. We also used beacon hibernation concept uh, for this mission. This was one of the cost enablers for us, one reason why we were able to keep those costs down. We have the autonomy system on board the spacecraft that constantly monitors the spacecraft for any faults. And when, it's, when the spacecraft's in hibernation, that um, autonomy system is instructed to monitor critical faults of every uh, subsystem that those engineers have given us. And um, if it sees something that's abnormal, it will command the radio, the RF system to put out a certain frequency, and we call it a, just call it a tone. So normally, we, in hibernation, we listen for the spacecraft tone once a week. And if we hear what we have defined as a green tone, we just close down and then we look for the tone the next week. But if we hear something other than green, then we know that we have a problem on our hand. But even though we may hear a, a different tone other than green, we automatically know and within you know, 15 minutes what kind of fault is happening on that spacecraft. So we can start to put together our recovery plan. We had 18 hibernation periods. Um, before we woke up for the final time before the um, Pluto approach. That was December 6, 2014. And here you can see, if you look real closely, I think this one is, yeah, ro rotating. So you can see there is a slight wobble there. This is what Pluto and Karen look like in January. We're taking optical navigation measurements so that we can determine if we're on the right path to hit a particular point in space at a specified time. And what we want to do is we want to hit that point about 7,800 miles above the surface of Pluto. And so in order to do that, our deep space navigators, we had two teams. Remember, we talked about contingencies. So we had a kinetics team and a JPL team, and they constantly checked each other on their solutions just to make sure that um, there wasn't something in either of their systems that would introduce some kind of error. 
And this is what those images look like. So unprocessed on the right side and then as we process it, and then you can see the moon's resolved on the, on the final image. And this is what we looked like in May, I'm sorry, in April on the top, and then May on the bottom, and then the different views we had of Pluto in June. And so you can really see that that picture of Pluto is starting to resolve. We're seeing more definition in those light and dark patches. And if you were there the night of, or the morning of July 14th when we unveiled that image, um, you can, if you know what that is, you can actually see it in here. But of course, we didn't know what it was. This was still kind of fuzzy. So we had hazard measurements that were going on at the same time as this. And hazards, I, you know, you can call them moons, but we chose to call them hazards in the ops world. <laughs> And um, we were also, besides looking to make sure we knew what path we were on and we were on the right path um, and doing cor correction maneuvers if we need to, we were also looking to see if we could see anything in our path that would cause us to want to divert as well. So our last trajectory correction maneuver was on June 30th. And we got a message back from our navigation team that says you're spot on, you don't have to do that final correction maneuver that you had planned for July 4th. And we said, that's great, because what that means is that um, we can go to our next step, which was to ask our hazard team, have you, have you detected anything as we get closer? And so on July 2nd, they came back to us and they said, no, we don't see anything. You're clear to load that best observation sequence of the Pluto system. So this is great. Now, this nine-day flyby sequence takes 80% of the spacecraft memory. Normally, we use 50% for the load that's executing or sequence that's executing on board the spacecraft, and the other 50%, the load that has just completed, that's where we put the new one up. But because this nine, and they're usually a two-week period, but because this flyby sequence was so intense with science observation, it took 80% of the memory. And the important part, the um, the important thing there is that that other 20% only lasted four days on the spacecraft. So that meant we had to get a sequence up to the spacecraft within that four-day period. And if you're in the ops world, you know you have a prime um, opportunity and a backup opportunity. And um, so we, our first opportunity to load that prime sequence was on July 4th. And remember, we talked about round trip light time being four hours and 25 minutes. So we started loading that prime sequence, nine day flyby sequence, to the spacecraft at about 4.30 in the morning on July 4th. It takes two hours to radiate all those commands at 2,000 2, bits per second. So it's a pretty huge load. About a round trip light time later, we're in the Mission Operations Center, it's about 1 p.m. There's about five of us in the op center watching the computer on board the spacecraft receive those commands. Now remember, we're looking at something that happened in the past, really, because it happened four and a half hours ago. About 54 minutes into this, and I say about, you know, I can't remember the seconds, but <laughs> um, we lost all communications with the spacecraft. And first thought was, there's something wrong with the ground system. We checked those ground system connections. We asked the Deep Space Network to check. Everything's perfect. So here we are, our worst nightmare. We don't have contact with the spacecraft. It seems like the whole world is watching us. And we don't have any telemetry. In the ops center, um, my autonomy engineer was in there as well. He said, Brian, tell me what we could be seeing. Don't tell me all the possible faults, because if you've ever developed autonomy um, code, you know there is a myriad of faults that could, you know, paths that that software will do. And he said, OK, there's two two scenarios we might be in. One of them we've seen before, 
and it would take 108 minutes for the autonomy system to recover the spacecraft and start outputting a signal. The other one we have not seen before, although we've coded for it, so we, we anticipated it, but we hope we'd never see it. He said that one would take 55 minutes for the system to reconfigure. Looked at the wall clock, it was a little bit before two, so we were within that 60 minute time frame. And I said, okay, flight controllers, please have the DSN reconfigure for that signal output, which I'm talking to engineers, so it's gonna be switching from RCP to LCP, totally different um, side of the RF system. And you know, part of you really, really wants to get contact back with the spacecraft. And then the other part of you is like, geez, we've got a long way to go if we get that signal on this kind of um, frequency. And we did. We locked up to that signal at 3.11 p.m. July 4th. Um, spacecraft was, health was healthy. It's outputting 10 bits per second. We'd spun up, so we're not in three-axis mode. We can't take pictures of the Pluto system. And we're three days away from that nine-day encounter sequence start. So we, you know, after allowing ourselves to have that gut-riching feeling in the pit of our stomachs for about 15 seconds, which seemed like a long time, <laughs> um, we all jumped back on the horse and um, did what we were trained to do. We'd not seen this anomaly before in flight, but we'd gone through anomalies before with the spacecraft. We all knew what we needed to do. Phone calls started being made. People started to assemble. We started to convene the anomaly resolution board and um, over the next three days we developed and sent up commands to the spacecraft to have it recover back into three axis mode where we could where it could accept the nine day flyby sequence and um, we had four hours to spare <laughs> but that nine day flyby sequence engaged on time and without a lot of science loss. Um, we lost communications for 77 minutes. We lost about 30 science um, activities. None of them were deemed critical. And we engaged that sequence on time. So this is our path through the Pluto system. Um, and at the bottom of the screen, I'm not even sure where to point this, but at the bottom of the screen, July, uh, well, if we do, let's just do local times, <laughs> July 13th in the evening, um, we had our last contact with the spacecraft. We got down an image of the Pluto system. We also had contingencies there. We were downlinking stuff on the way in that would satisfy some of the group one objectives just in case we could not reestablish contact with the spacecraft after we pass through the system. And so there's 22 hours here where the spacecraft's off doing its own thing. And the video clip that I showed you at the beginning of the presentation was the mock on July 14th at 8.53 p.m. and us getting that signal. And I said before we were going to hit a particular point in space 7,800 miles above the surface of Pluto. We came in 83 seconds early and 50 miles low. But that was within our error bars, so the pictures were not smeared. So scientists are happy. A few pictures of that night um, down at the bottom are the pictures taken um, in the Kazi Center where we had a public watching and then remember this picture of Hubble, the best picture we had of Pluto. And we were able to deliver this and show the world what Pluto really looked like. And so I think it's just extremely fitting that this planet has a big old heart on it. So um, this, the heart part, we believe, is methane ice that's flowed down from these mountains. 
And this is a picture of those mountains and that atmosphere. Remember we were talking about the atmosphere? Look at the striations in that atmosphere. How many different levels, um, the, the depth that, that the atmosphere has. These mountains are water ice mountains. At the temperatures in Pluto, they're, they're extremely hard. Methane ice is um, more like a slush, and so we believe that that methane slush is sliding down these water ice mountains into this plain where the heart is. And the, the crevices, and, the, and it's, just, it's just simply amazing. Um, again, I can't say how much this, this planet and this system has revealed of the, of the Kuiper Belt. And if the rest of the Kuiper Belt is as interesting as this, I think we better <laughs> start proposing a lot of missions. This is Charon. Um, we believe there's some kind of chemical process mechanism, transfer mechanism going on between Pluto and Charon. Pluto has got an atmosphere, so it, it, has, it can break down components um, when it the ultraviolet light can break down components. And these reddish things are called tholins. Um, they're the result of the methane being broken down into components. And then we believe that there's some kind of transfer mechanism going from Pluto into Charon. And the pole area, obviously, is the, very, is the coldest part of Charon. And it's being deposited in that region. Um, but Charon, without an atmosphere, we don't believe that that, that material can get back to Pluto. And notice that crevice across um, the body of the moon. And we believe that there, at one time, Charon was warm, and it had an underground uh, ocean. And as that uh, moon cooled off, that, that ocean froze and created this um, rift across the planet. These are the moons. Um, pretty interesting moons. And then, of course, the, the outpouring of excitement on the, the night of the July 14th. Um, so many people around the world were, were just enthused by this. And it reminds me of the days of the Apollo mission when you know, our younger generation, me included, I was young then, um, were inspired by the, by the Apollo missions and the walk on the moon. And um, we even got a tweet from Obama, which we thought that was pretty cool. And then looking back on Pluto, if Pluto hadn't delivered enough, we took a few pictures as we passed the system with the sun behind the planet. And lo and behold, we see a blue sky. Just amazing. Where are we off to now? We have enough propellant to go to a Kuiper Belt object, and we've targeted 2014 MU69, and we're hoping to have naming rights when we fly by it, because we don't think that's a cool name. Um, <laughs> so we shall see. Um, we were approved by NASA to do the burns, to target the KBO, but we are not yet funded to do the extended mission. Um, and so I have to say that um, if we are funded for that extended mission, the encounter will be January 1st, 2019. And if you're just as enthused, or maybe not if even as enthused as I am about Pluto, if you want to see pictures, um, there's pictures coming down every week, every couple days. We collected so much data in that 10 or 15 day period, and we're so far away. Our um, three axis uh, 10 degree rate is about 1200 bits per second. It'll take um, on the order of 16 to 17 months to get all this data on the ground. So there are new pictures being posted every couple of days, and um, you can go there and find them. So thank you very much. Um, I appreciate your time, and thank you for having me. Sure. Um, does anyone have any questions? Um, your, one of your last slides showed the tremendous um, interest on social media, and you said you haven't been funded for this last uh, effort that you want to do. Had you thought of going to one of those fundraising sites, or, just <laughs> a, or, uh, or are you forbidden by some sort of government regulation? My guess is if, if that $144 million 
Facebook page users each donated 10 cents, you could probably keep the spacecraft flying beyond your lifetime. You know, that is a really excellent idea. <laughs> Thank you. A <laughs> uh, question here. Uh, so, um, was that the first time a spacecraft um, has taken a picture of, a, you know, something like that, you know, a, a planet uh, traveling that speed? Um, how, you know, how do you achieve that? How do you plan for that? Um, so I, I don't know if it was the only one that had uh, taken a picture traveling at that speed. I suspect not, just because the Voyager missions were first reconnaissances, and I think that they probably were traveling quite fast. If we have any Voyager people in the audience, um, please pipe up. Um, and the way we did that is we, there was a lot of planning. So we were trying to hit a particular point at a particular time, and then we had an error margin. Three sigma is what we were using, and so that's how we plan those observations. So if we had found that we were um, not going to hit that point within that error margin, then we would have done what we call a knowledge update. And what that does is it applies a delta into the processor, and it shifts all the commands a certain amount of time, either forward or backward. So um, that was how we plan to compensate for it if we had to adjust. Two questions. When you pass the next object, how close will you be? And secondly, uh, have you had to recalibrate, oh, you obviously have to recalibrate the sensors because of the dimmer light, and how much of an effect will that have on your science collection? So the, the first question, um, there is a debate um, how close we're going to fly to the KBO. Um, the scientists want to fly at about 2,000 kilometers, <laughs> and the ops people want to fly at like 10,000. <laughs> So we're discussing that. So somewhere in there. Um, for the, the second question about recalibrating, um, I, I'm not sure we need to because those instruments were, were built for very dim light. But we do have calibrations that we normally do every year. We're going to be doing another set um, this summer. So I guess the jury's out on that one. Okay, thank you very much.